Hi, and welcome to Tech Field Day Extra at Interop, Las Vegas 2015. My name is Tom Hollingsworth. I am an organizer on the Tech Field Day event series. And we have a large number of Tech Field Day delegates and networking professionals here at Interop this year. We're happy to have the opportunity to grab a few of them off the show floor, bring them into a room, and let them discuss some of the hot topics in networking. And uh, I think we've got some really interesting things that we want to share today around the idea of, of uh, white box switching. First, I'm going to let our panel introduce themselves. And then after that, uh, we'll get started with a great discussion. All right, Keith, you want to go ahead and start? Sure, thanks. Uh, my name is Keith Parsons. I have a company called Wireless Land Professionals, and I blog at wlandpros.com. Hi, um, my name is Gideon Tam, and my uh, Twitter handle is uh, MF Mala. And I'm Terry Slattery. I'm with NetCraftsman, and I blog at netcraftsman.com and nojitter.com. Ethan Banks at ecbanks on Twitter, packetpushers.net, and ethancbanks.com. Ivan Pibunyak at iOS Fins and ibspace.net. And I'm Greg Ferro from ethereumind.com, and I can be found on the Twitter as at ethereumind. I'm Stephen Foskett. I blog at blog.foskets.net, and you can find me on the Twitters, as Greg would say, at sfoskett. Ed Whedon, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Avalon Hawk. Ed Horley, uh, I blog at howfunky.com. I'm with Group Work Technologies, and uh, I'm at E. Horley. I'm Justin Paul at Reckless Op on Twitter, and I blog at jpaul.me. All right, so who has something they'd like to open with about white box switching? Okay, I'll just dive in with a comment and just get some impressions from you guys. <laughs> the, um, one of the things I've noticed about this show is uh, Dell, first of all, coming up with their open networking. They're really pushing that idea hard. And the, the notion coming from Dell is we're going to make a switch. It's going to be a hardware switch. It's going to have whatever the hardware characteristics of this Ethernet switch are, port density and rack units and power and all that stuff. But they're saying that the switch they announced yesterday, the Z9100, is an open networking switch, meaning it ships with ONI, and it's going to come with some kind of a Dell operating system by default, but you can spec it with a bunch of other things, too. And then walking around the floor with uh, Greg, we noticed that there's a couple of other white box switch vendors that are out there displaying their wares. Uh, in other words, hey, end users, it's not just a Cisco and, a, and an HP and a, you know, whoever game. It's, you know, open networking seems to be a, a big deal now. White box seems to be, you know, a real market. Um, did you guys have an impression on that? I think, well, the interesting thing is, you know, we talked about this on our network break show a few days ago uh, about IDC reducing, releasing numbers in December saying that 7% by value, so value? Seven, since when, since yeah. when do we have IDC quotes on that building? <laughs> it's not a Gartner quote. It's not a, it's not a, <laughs> What IDC has done is they surveyed the market and come up with a number. And by their estimate, 7% 7 of switch sales in 2014 was white box. So if you figure that a white box switch is about one quarter of the value of a vendor product, something like one fifth of all switches shipped in 2014 were white box, as a rough approximation, which is a lot more than we normally think about, right? If you think one in five switches is already white box, now admittedly, not going into the enterprise, it'll be going into one of the cloud companies most likely. But that impact on the market has already happened. It just hasn't broken out into where traditional IT is being done. Well, that, so that's a question I have for you guys that consult, like, like Terry and whoever else here is uh, dealing with a lot of end customers. Is there an interest in the white box switching market from what you're seeing? I haven't seen any from end customers that are running enterprises. Um, I just met with a customer talking about, okay, should we be, what should we do with SDN? educate us on SDN, and at the end of the day, three, four hour meeting, at the end of the day, it was like, well, um, we could do Microsoft Link QLS. Um, we'll have to think about whether there's another application within the enterprise that would apply. In other words, they're asking about SDN, and Link is that, seems to be that killer app for the enterprise. Uh, I don't know, I, I wouldn't classify it as a killer, killer app, app. Yeah. okay, <laughs> for SDN. I don't think yeah. it's the thing that justifies SDN by itself, right, okay. It is a thing that could play with SDN, whether it makes sense to them or not. I think it probably does not at this point for this organization. And they're a traditional enterprise type organization. So this kind of goes back to that IDC thing, Greg, because the percentage, 
is kind of assumed to have been cloud providers. Those are the guys buying it, not enterprise yeah. so much. Mm -hmm. Big right. cloud providers, small yes. cloud providers are nothing. But as always, you know, the, you have the U curve. Mm -hmm. And even in the cloud provider space, you have the U curve. Mm -hmm. The really big cloud providers are buying this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The really small cloud providers are buying this because they have to squeeze out every penny. Mm -hmm. And people in the middle who actually have a business model that differentiates them from Amazon's, mm -hmm. they don't care. Yeah. Well, the network ad for a lot of companies is not very important. It's like it's a small dollar value of the overall. Most of the money is being spent on the application software and cloud providers to do the orchestration. You know, the key value is that portal interface that customers see, and that's where all the software development and all the money is being invested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's also the other thing. If you take a look at the overall spend, mm -hmm. I was talking with a few people recently, and they went like, you know what, cabling was more expensive than switches. <laughs> so why are you trying to save money on the last 5% of your expenses mm -hmm. if this can bring down your whole service? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know why it makes sense for Amazon and Google of yeah. the world and Facebooks, because 1% is still huge money. Mm -hmm. But if I have to trade off service availability versus 1% of my capital expenses, I get lost. I guess the flip side of that is that as volume of these products ramp up, they're going to be more and more available in the market. And the price, you know, in normal, like any business, the greater the volume, the cheaper the price should become over time. Now, networking has done a really great job of not reducing in price over the last 20 years. And, and you know, we're seeing, and I think with SDN, one of the things that I'm seeing with SDN is there's no increase in budget. So you can't expect to pay the same amount for your network hardware and then pay another amount for your software on top of it. Something's got to give. So SDN has to have cheaper hardware to be able to let you go and spend money on the SDN software. And, and that's one of the key points that, it, that I make in my presentations on, about SDN is, okay, so you have these white label boxes. They're theoretically going to be cheaper, but a lot of people are talking about how that's going to reduce the price of an SDN-based network. And I would, yeah. no, I don't think it's no. going to decrease no, the price. It's, it's the, price the price will simply shift yeah. from the hardware to the software control system. So don't talk about price reduction on your network hardware and software. Think about it's going to transfer to somewhere else. Yeah, and this brings me to a discussion. So I gave a presentation uh, yesterday on software-defined WAN. And one of the things that strikes me about using software-defined technologies to define the WAN is the fact that it doesn't need to integrate with everybody else. So the data center, getting SDN into the data center is going to be years away because you can't just deploy an SDN-defined network and then have your servers go over the top and your storage has to change and the operations people have to change the way they allocate VLANs and all of the, you know, you have the whole team has to change and the data center, of course, is on a 10-year investment cycle. You, you know, you've probably bought some vendor switches on the expectation that they're going to, you know, you put them in the rack, bolted them down and they'll be rotten, you know, rotten, mouldy pieces of rubbish by the time you take them back out, you know. Yeah. Well, that was exactly the problem that this customer had. They had invested in fabric path. Yeah. Okay, and they're, they're going, nice. we're getting ready to go buy some more switches. What should we buy? Yeah. And, well, and the end result what? was, you probably shouldn't change. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not at this juncture. Exactly. So one of the things that's coming clear to me is that software-defined networking in the data center isn't going to happen in a hurry. It's going to be a slow-motion car crash. And you sort of, it's going to creep in. It's going to be like IPv6, I think. Oh, no, don't say that. <laughs> you mean it's never going to happen? <laughs> um, 20, 20 years in the making for 10% penetration. Sure. So software-defined WAN, on the other hand, doesn't have the anti-patterns. So I like to talk about what is it that slows the tech? What are the anti-patterns that prevent things from happening? In the software-defined WAN, the, networker, the network engineer or the networking team owns the WAN. If you change the way packets flow across the WAN, you don't have to change storage or desktops or security policies or you don't have to change the way that network ops works, right? And so this technology looks like it actually might take off first, and long that, before the data center that's, does. That's really insightful because you see that all throughout the data center. There's so many places. I mean, one of the reasons that you guys love to make fun of storage is because storage is still the same now that it used to be 20 years ago, mm -hmm. which I completely agree with you. There's been very slow innovation, but one reason is because it's so disruptive to change. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that makes it resistant to change. That makes it risky to change. And, you know, yet you find things around the periphery uh, or net new things. You know, VDI was a, was a new application, which mm -hmm. made it a little more palatable than totally changing your data center infrastructure. But VDI is taking a decade. 
just like IPv6. Yeah. <laughs> Greg, I wanted to bring up another point about the SD-WAN thing taking off. There's a conversation that we were having with, I think, Rob Sherwood at, at Big Switch, and uh, part of that conversation was, we need as an industry to stop selling SDN and start selling applications that happen to use SDN because mm -hmm. customers don't actually want SDN. They want it to do something. So SD-WAN WAN so is a prime the, example. So did you see the link that Ricky, our audio, the Packet Pushers audio guy sent yeah. about um, there's this uh, audio visual company and what they do is they produce video production software. And underneath that is a full-on SDN programmed fabric to drive all of the, and they use IP communications across an SDN enabled fabric to control the whole studio. Lights, cameras, recording, video streaming, transcoders, the whole bit. And they don't, they don't root it, they SDN it as a flow engine. Yeah. An application on top of an S you'll never hear anybody yes. talking about an SDN enabled video production suite, but that's what they're doing. Yes. Like people might want to buy you know, Microsoft Link SDN you know, as, a, mm -hmm. you know, as an application there that enables quality of service dynamically, mm -hmm. uh, that might be a, a good application. Whether it's a killer app, right, you know, the question, but <laughs> you're buying functionality, you're not buying capability. You're buying, it, you're buying SDN to do something for you. Right. It, it's, an, it's an enabler. It's the connect, you know, we're still, uh, today, the SDN, the mainstream SDN solutions are still just connecting servers to the data center. You know, and then you, you sort of go through all this thing and you evaluate, you know, Look at ACI and NSX and NewArch and you know all the different SDN solutions that you've got. And in the end, you go, I plug the server in here, and it talks to the server over here, and it hasn't moved the needle. But the future of SDN is these applications. But that's still years away because we can't throw out the hardware in the data center. We can't change the practices. We can't change the way the server team work or the storage team talk to their, you know, antipad. So what's so what's driving getting back to the white box side? <laughs> Which is, is the SDN driving the white box requirement or is it the other way around? Because I mean, if you do analysis, I think Jeff Doyle did a presentation at the Rocky Mountain V6 event and he actually talked about if you included Google's switching platform, they would be the number two manufacturer of switching in the world after Cisco, yeah. which is a really interesting number if you think about it that way. Is the market going to change yes, because of that? White box is already, if you took all the white box that was sold last year, that makes them the number two vendor. Yes. But Google alone, no. Yes, Google alone, yes. How many servers do they have? Uh, They're not saying. They don't say. Probably estimated around about 300,000. 300,000 servers? Yeah. That's what? 10,000 switches? 10,000 switches and that's number two in this market? Come on. Nobody's buying 10 gig switches. Most people have still got one gig in their data center. Uh, it, it was just it was just a point uh, he had brought he had brought up in one of his presentations. I thought it was sort of interesting. I mean, even if you were number three or number four, that still changes the landscape pretty dramatically versus what we're seeing in the traditional market today. White box begins to have more penetration in the market when it it doesn't matter what the device is that sits under there. If you have a, a Cisco box that's doing fabric path for you, and you then you need that. You need a Cisco box that does fabric path to continue to grow that network. But if you move to an SDN-enabled environment that is speaking something generic like OpenFlow, and that happens to meet all of your needs, then who cares what the platform is? You buy the cheapest thing that's reliable, and you, you bolt it in there. Just and you're locked into the controller. Don't forget that. Fair. Well, and that's definitely the tactic that, that Facebook is taking, right, with Wedge and with everything else, right? That's, that definitely seems to be the direction they want to go. OCP it. Let everyone take the the base framework and, and... Well, it's even more confusing. We're seeing things like, um, there's a company called IP Fusion this week who've been making operating systems for switches and routers for 25 years. Uh, literally, most of the campus networking products that came from most of the vendors that you know, the household names, have been rebadging an operating system from IP Fusion. IP Fusion is now going direct to market. Oh, you can now go and buy that operating system. And that operating system is as viable as any big vendor operating system that you care to know. Because they've been supplying to big vendors for a long, for a long way. It's had 20 years of development, 20 years of quality, 20 years of scaling, all the claims that you make. And you can now buy that and put it on a white box. Uh -huh. Interesting. So, you know, it really is. the yeah. disintermediation in the disruption is here, it just hasn't been evenly distributed yet. And, and, so, sorry, William. So are, are we taking bets on who's going <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to... I think one of the things that, to go back to the question of what's driving it here, is it, is it the white box hardware or is it the control system? And I think they're maturing kind of step by step each way. 
And one of the things I'm seeing, um, I'm doing a, a talk tomorrow on SDN and UC integration. And one of the things I'm seeing is this lack of really good integration back from the SDN controller through what I call a middleware system back to the UC applications. Because you may have several UC applications that need to talk to the software-defined network. And you're not going to talk all directly to the SDN controller. There needs to be some middleware that's, that's an arbiter between these different apps. So if you have Microsoft Link, you're more than likely going to have Polycom in there as well mm -hmm. as your, your telepresence system. Well, now you have two UC controllers that are fighting for the same bandwidth. Who arbitrates that? So I think there's going to be this intermediate level thing there, and that's still ill-defined at this point. I'd be happy if I just had one app. Oh. <laughs> Gary, also don't forget that most people that implement that link integration, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been just speaking with the HP guys this morning, Okay. and they tried to do what Greg is preaching, which is flow across the network, mm -hmm. and then they figured out that, hey, gee, we don't have tables in the core switches to support that, mm -hmm. so what do we do? So right now what they're doing is they're doing the SCP marking. Just at the edge. At the edge. Yes. And then you need proper QoS like we always have. In static QoS in the, in in the core. core. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's all you can do at scale. Mm -hmm. right. That's kind of waste of what we did today. Right. I'm not saying it is. It's on the main cost. Mm -hmm. Right. And, that, and that's, that's the key thing. It's, it's dynamic. At least it's dynamic and reliably, predictably configured by a piece of software that can accurately make it happen over time. It's better than static. It's an improvement, but it's not, you know, it's not what we want in the long run. Yeah.